all right, well, I don't want to wait 10 years. Yeah. Right. So how fast can I put in these 10,000 hours, like real intentional hours? Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing that I would say is just be aware that it's going to take all of you up front. The second thing that I would say is I'm a big welcome back to the leaders only podcast where we talk about business leadership mindset and just pretty much anything revolved around building an incredible life you know one of the reasons that i started this podcast is because i felt like on the way to where we're at now there wasn't really a place to go to learn tangible skills that are needed in order to succeed and further yourself and just get better overall in every area of your life and so some background about me you know i built a sales company that does over eight figures a year i own over 10 million dollars worth of real estate and i've built a multiple seven figure income that's streamlined and in all honesty doesn't really need me I plan on teaching you and documenting everything that I learned along the way. And if you get something out of today's message, if you can do me a favor, if you can like, share, and subscribe, it will give us the ability to further our message and help more people, which is what we're all about. Thank you guys so much. Let's dive in. I'm a big mode. You can't get a lot of Brother, thank you so much for having me. And, and uh, to be honest with you, I was so excited for today just because I feel like, you know, you and me have the same morals, the same values, and we believe in the same things. You know, like even even offline a second ago we were just talking about how you can have it all where you can have an incredible business do incredibly well financially and your marriage doesn't have to sacrifice the relationship with your kids doesn't have to sacrifice and i think right. it's so cool and so i um i love the motto of the show do hard things right because yeah. i believe that the only way for you to get better like you mentioned is to, to do those hard things but right. uh, for those of you who don't know my name is matthew welsh um, i actually started out in the insurance space back when i was 19 so got into the financial industry and um, you know, did pretty well there, um, ended up building an agency that now has over 1100 licenses in it. Um, mm -hmm. it's my wife's now she runs that division of our life now. And so she has it going at about 1100 licenses right now and growing by about a hundred every single month. And, um, also got into the real estate side just cause we've had so much excess capital coming in that started investing in real estate and grew a portfolio at over 12 million. And, um, we're actually in the process of actually selling off that portfolio as we speak. And so, wow. yeah, it's got wow. a lot of, a lot of great stuff. And now I do a a lot of you know mentorship and business consulting the whole nine yards there yeah i love how you were like yeah we had an excess of cash that's a that's a good problem to have yeah <laughs> you're, you're like yeah my insurance company is uh, bringing in so much cash i don't know what to do with it i should go buy real estate <laughs> well to be, honest, to be honest with you dude like i was i was talking to somebody the other day and i think one of the things that most people in business and entrepreneurship do is they in, try to invest too soon mm. right like when you're in the midst of trying to get a business off the ground the excess capital should be going back, back into, into the it. business yep. But then it gets to a point where the business is thriving so much that you have so much excess capital that it's almost ignorant not to invest it. Yeah. And that's kind of what happened. And I grew up in construction just because my dad did construction. And so I kind of knew how much things would cost to remodel and, you know, actually how to do the work myself as well right. if I needed to. And so yeah. that was just an area that I, I had a higher level of education on and I didn't have education and everything else. And I didn't have the... Uh, the attention to detail to go trade stocks all day long. I'm yeah. not that skillful, you know? <laughs> well, you rem it reminds me, you know, there's like, we see all these quotes online that's like, the average millionaire has seven streams of income, blah, blah, blah. And I think people interpret that as like, oh, I got to start generating seven mm -hmm. streams of income right now. Like yeah. I'm making 80,000 a year. I, I should have seven. I should be doing a crypto and then I should be doing, you know, 4X and mm -hmm. I should be doing you know, insurance. And then, oh, let me do solar on the side. And like, oh, let me, let me, do, let me also do Uber. It's like, no master one yep. thing become exceptionally well at that one thing mm -hmm. and then you said it right and then when you are first trying to make money reinvest back into you because you will always be your best investment yeah right you will always be your best investment right not and not even real estate or your company like you so first of all right you invested back into you into your company then Sounds like, of course, you got there, you start to reinvest into other things. So yeah. um, walk us through that. I mean, what did it take, right? You mentioned you, you know, you have an insurance um, business with 1,100 licensed agents. That's amazing. Um, walk us through, like, what was that like for you? What was that journey of you first building that first income? Yeah. Well, man, um, a lot of work, right? A lot of work. Because I got in at 19. So one of the benefits of getting into like anything business related or entrepreneurship. I'm 28, so okay. I just turned 28 a couple months ago. And so I got into it at 19 and all my, and I pretty much slept in the office, right? And that was one of the benefits because I didn't have my wife at the time. I didn't have my daughter, our daughter that's on the way. I didn't have these, these overwhelming amount of responsibilities. So I literally just slept in the office. So wow. I remember I came in and I met somebody regarding the business on a Friday and he broke down the business. On Saturday, I went in for a financial seminar. Monday, I quit everything that I was doing, right? So I had a, 
um, a marketing website company that I had been working on for a year with a business partner of mine, and I dropped that cold turkey. I was working as a as a cold side chef, and I can't cook to save, to save my life, by the way. My <laughs> wife will tell you that, I promise you. Um, but I was working as a cold side chef in a restaurant to support us as we were trying to get that business off the ground. I called that person and said, hey, I'm putting in my two weeks because I didn't want to leave them cold turkey. I just didn't feel right about it. Um, and so I left everything that I was doing, and I just dove into the space without making a single penny, right? And um, and I just saw an opportunity where I can build something that I can keep one day. I saw an opportunity that I could take care of my family who really needed uh, me at the time because I had a dad that was battling cancer. Mm. Um, and I saw it as an opportunity to have the life that I always wanted. Yeah. You know, because I grew up in a place called Claremont here in San Diego. Um, and back in high school, I had friends that went to La Jolla. Mm. Right. So I would drive down to La Jolla all the time just because I had a lot of friends down there. And we would, I would go to their houses and I would go see their parents' cars. Yeah. And it was just absurd. Just this incredible life and I always wanted it I just didn't know how to get it wow and so when I came in at 19 I finally saw an opportunity for me to get it yeah right and so it was more of a selfish you know reason at the beginning but I think that's how it typically sets, yeah. uh, starts with most people like I feel like every successful person started with selfish goals and then they get all the financial success they want and they realize they're unfulfilled because right. it was about them yeah and then that's when most people transition to trying to help other people but right. in the very beginning it was 16 17 hour days i don't think i took a day off for my first two and a half years three years in the business wow um i just dedicated every ounce of me to it yeah yeah i love that um when i was uh in high school similar story i hung out i was like i wouldn't say i was like i was like lower middle class growing mm -hmm. up you know my parents did okay um, but uh, I hung out with also a lot of like kind of like the rich kids in my area. I grew up in mm -hmm. Ohio. Okay. And similar story. I just somehow got connected. I don't really remember how, but I just somehow got connected with them. And I hung out with the people that went to like the private schools. You yeah. Know? And I was like the one. I was the one person in like like the kind of like <laughs> average public school system. You know. But yeah, for sure. same dude. I got to I got to like hang out and they're like whoa like they drive Cadillacs and they drive Mercedes and I I had a 1997 you know Ford. Uh, Escort, uh, a yeah. green. I still remember it, a green escort it has this big hole in the back seat. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember <laughs> what this car looks like, and I would be showing up in that car. They're like in Mercedes dude, and with Cadillacs, the subwoofer, you know, <laughs> What's that? with the subwoofer. Yeah, you know? yeah, dude. And yeah, so, dude. but it, I didn't know it then, but I think that's what planted the the idea of like, like, man, like you, there's more out there, mm -hmm, right? Sure. And I, I know I fed into the kind of belief that the only thing that was for me was like the nine to five, the go work for 40 years. And, 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 hey, like, and, and I'm not against that if that's what you want to do, but I always knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do. Yeah. And so similar to you, you know, I got exposed to network marketing in my early 20s and mm -hmm. that really opened up my eyes to be like, man, what's possible? Yeah. And it's crazy what happens when you are aware of an opportunity Mm -hmm. right and you go after it and i love how our stories are pretty identical in the sense of like the first two three years it was a grind for you and i think people are quick to quit if they don't see results right away for sure so like what would you say to those people that are starting out right you're someone that has not just built yourself up but someone that has built a team of a lot of people up as well which yeah. that's a whole different skill set in itself so like what do you say to the new guy that's like in your shoes when you were 19 years old, because right now we have this instant gratification <laughs> world where people want to see results now, now, yeah. now, now. And if they don't see it, they quit. Like, oh, I, I did this for 90 days, it's, it doesn't work. Yeah, No, dude, it takes time, yeah. right? It takes nine months for a baby to be formed. It takes two years for an elephant to be formed. Give it time. So like, what would you say to those new people? What, what If you could talk to, I guess, 19 year old you, what would you say to that person that's just starting out? Yeah, dude, that's a great question. Um, I would just say the day you plant the seed is not the day you get the fruit. Oof. You know, like good. if I went into the backyard right now and I buried a seed and I watered it every day for even a month, it would be complete ignorance for me to think, oh, I'm going to have a fruit tomorrow. Like I love guacamole, so I'll grow as many avocado trees as I possibly could. Right. Yeah. But the day I plant the seed, I'm not going to get the harvest the next day. So there's got to be patience. You got to have patience when it comes to, to building something. And then you also got to realize like it takes time to develop skill, yeah. right? Like they always say 10,000 hours or 10 years, right? And so to master something, right? Yeah. 10,000 hours or 10 years. And so my philosophy was, all right, well, I don't want to wait 10 years, yeah. right? So how fast can I put in these 10,000 hours? Like real intentional hours. Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing that I would say is just be aware that it's going to take all of you up front. The second thing that I would say is make the commitment and decision up front that you're not going to quit. 
Okay. I think when you make that, you know, burn the boats type of decision, it makes it a lot easier to take the island because you have nothing to retreat to. Right. And so for me, when I got in, I I got rid of all plan Bs. I got rid of all backward plans. I just didn't believe in it. Right. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? If I really think this can get me to where I want to be, if I know that the the path is there, it's just going to require me to work hard, then I'm going to burn all boats so that way I have nothing to quit. Right. So I always just tell people like rule number one, make the upfront decision that you're not going anywhere because it makes everything else easy. Like when, you know, I'm trying to learn a skill, I can't learn it. Well, I'm not going anywhere. Might as well learn the skill, right? Um, I'm scared to do this. Well, I'm not going anywhere. So it's either I face that fear now or I'm gonna regret it in 20 years that I didn't face it today. For me, that was public speaking, right? Um, There's just all sorts of things like that. So I would just say, you know, be willing to put in the hours. And then last thing that I would say is find someone who's already done it that has a vested interest in you, that's good. right? Like that's so important. And not just someone who's already done it, someone yeah. who has a vested interest in you. Wow. And so, you know, one thing that I loved about the financial space, and I know it's the same thing in the solar space, right? Mm-hmm. Is that you have people where the better you do, the better they do. Right. So why in a million years would they ever recommend for you to go do something that's not going to put your family in a better spot? It just doesn't make sense. And so when you find someone who has a vested interest and they have the success that you want to have, they have the life that you want to have, and not even just financially and in business, but they have the marriage that you want to have. They have the relationship with, you know, whatever they believe in, right? Like when they have all of those things in place, right now you start to bridge the gap quicker, Yeah. you know, because it's kind of like if I put in a GPS, the GPS already knows all the slow routes and knows where the potholes are and knows mm-hmm. where the the policeman's waiting out it knows yeah. the the roads what not to take it knows the roads that have traffic going on right now so your gps automatically calculates the quickest route between where you are and where you want to be yeah hence why i'll go 20 minutes and i always type in a gps even if i know where i'm going just because i want to get there as fast as i possibly can right well that's kind of like having a mentor that's kind of yeah. like having someone who has a vested interest in you because they've already hit the pot rolls right or the potholes they already know which roads don't what that which roads to take they can see the traffic coming now from a mile away so they know which right. exit to take if needed so having someone like that in your corner in your life makes it a lot easier to succeed quickly yeah dude god bless gps's remember yeah, the, remember the days of MapQuest? <laughs> yeah, going to every soccer tournament on MapQuest and missing the exit dude i still remember my parents pr- like asking us, hey print out the map quest yeah. and then you know you're like you're in the car like like, all right. And then you like, I think we missed it. And, and then you're and like, you don't tri- know. <laughs> Dude, God bless so freaking GPS. Like, yeah. I, I think we sometimes forget how much of a value add that is to oh, our lives. Oh, sure. But that's a great analogy. You know, I never really thought of mentorship like that, um, like a GPS. You know, it's true. GPS just, they, they know more than you, mm-hmm. right? And they have more data than you. And they know where the tr- rush hour is at. And yeah. sometimes they'll know like, hey, you can either go here and or you can take a back road and it'll save you 15 minutes because, you know, it, it knows it's, it's clogged up. So what what are things that you look for in a mentor with where you're at right now? You know, because I think we always should have a mentor because yeah. the moment we become with the moment we think that we're not students anymore then that's the moment we actually start declining. And it can be, I've been there before where I'm like, oh, I got it, like, I don't need anybody anymore, you know? And, and that's when I started to see, I got I got stagnant. So um, what are the things that you look for in a mentor today? Yeah, I mean, proximity is power. And so I just, I wanna be as close to them as I possibly can. Um, and not just from an emotional and like friendship level too, because, you know, I think one of the, the false beliefs is that you can't have like a friendship with your mentor. Mm. And I think, I don't know, I've always disagreed with that because I realized that the people that I'm closest with, I have an easier time coaching because I can be brutally honest with them about the things that they need to work on. I just never allow them to cross the line of no longer being a mentee if if I'm coaching someone, right? So in the same thing, I'm looking for a mentor that will let me in, right? So I want them to let me in. And I had to fight to be let in to my current, into that current circle of where I get mentorship, right? But for me, it's they gotta have exactly what I want, not kind of what I want, mm. exactly what it is that I want. Um, and the reason I say that is because you might have people that are doing better than you, and then you take their advice, but then it brings you to them when you wanted to be somewhere else. Wow. Make sense? Yeah. So like for instance, let's say from, you know, we'll just use income for simplicity. Let's say I make 100, and let's say there's someone that makes a million, and let's say there's someone that makes a half a million, mm. right? Well, if I start listening to the person that makes a half a million, it could distract me from the million. 
It can distract me from the meal. Even though it seems like it's on the way, mm. it can be distracting. And so I, because then what if you get to the half a million and then you realize you have to go back to 300 to go to the million versus just going straight to the person who makes a million and now you don't have sure. to backtrack at all, right? Yeah. So for me, they have to have exactly what it is that I want. And I also have different mentors. I have mentors for my faith. I have mentors for you know my marriage. I have mentors for business and financial success. I have also mentors that just from, they just are so happy. You know, and, yeah. and I go to them when I'm and when I'm feeling like I'm struggling with some of my happiness or whatever it might be. Right. Yeah. So I have mentors for different areas of my life, but they have to have exactly what I want, not yeah. kind of what I want, because I don't want to get distracted and have to reroute yeah. or, or backtrack. And you said something really good at the end right there. Right. It's like having mentors for different areas of your life, because mm -hmm. uh, the truth is you're probably not going to find someone that's like Perfect. literally dialed in yeah. and like and their faith and their family, the fitness or finance, you know, like, uh, and if you do, that person probably isn't even marketing themselves that way anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, people usually like, if they're really good in their marriages, then that's what they market themselves as. Like, hey, or if they're really good in fitness, that's what they market, you know? So Max Sanquist, I had him on my podcast uh, last time, you know, he's okay. my mentor for fitness. You know, you go, you talk about uh, what you want, what they want. Like this dude has the body of a Greek mm. god. Like I think <laughs> I tell him that. I and tell I'm not him, hitting on him. I, I promise. <laughs> no, dude, he does, and he's like he's young and healthy and energetic and smart, intelligent, and so cool. I decided, like, dude, I'm gonna cool. I'm gonna pay you to mm -hmm. you know coach me in fitness. You know, and a lot of what I've done recently has been because of him and. He holds me accountable and it's good that he does. And when I don't want to work out, I'm also not like, oh, man, he's going to know I didn't work out. I don't want him to be like, yo, are you in the gym? Like, what's up? <laughs> so it's good, you know. I have uh, like Alex Claude. He's my leadership coach. Okay. You know, because I'm passionate about leadership and yeah, I, I want to talk more about that with you. But, you know, he's someone that's really helped me understand leadership at a deeper level and understand, you know, the value of things uh, of things like having a, a va values in your life or having a vision statement or belief statement, you mm -hmm. know, three, five year game plan for, for, for your life. And so, you know, there's that. And, you know, I, I, we have me and my wife have marriage type of uh, coaches, too. And uh, and you said friendships, too. Right. Like, I think I think some of my mentors are also friends They're not all like paid people. Yeah. Some of them are paid, oh, for you sure. know, but I would say actually at least half and not more are just m more or less friends that genuinely want to see me grow yeah. and they're just like hey we're doing this other kinds of kinds of our hearts because what i discovered is the ultra successful understands that if they make life about others life becomes bigger 100%. but when they make it about just themselves life becomes very smaller and we yeah. do believe in a u universal uh principle of sowing and reaping that hey if you sow mentorship if you sow goodness if you sow you know wisdom into others right then you will be blessed right and it's going to come back to you in, in one way or another and I think the ultra successful understands that. And so there are some people that's like, yeah, I'm willing to invest in you even if it's even if it even if I'm not necessarily charging you for it. So yeah. definitely, you know, there's an, uh, a level of importance in having mentorship in your life because can can people do it alone? Yeah, but it's going to take longer. It's going to take a lot longer. Yeah. Exactly. And I think had I learned that also earlier on and, you know, my when I started entrepreneurship when I was 24, um, 23. 23, 23, then I would have uh, been a lot further at now 32, you know, so uh, it's good to talk about that. Let, let's dive into um, your, you, you talk about leadership, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, you, you lead a team of 1100 agents and, you know, that's no easy feat. Um, talk us through some, like, what systems and processes do you have? Because I think when you get to that level, you're not so much managing probably people, you're probably more or less managing systems, mm -hmm. right? And because uh, I mean, if you're managing 1,100 people, that's 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 a lot of work to talk to them yeah. individually. Well, so I'm sure you're not. Um, so just talk us through through you know what 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 systems and processes have helped you scale. I because so I have a vision of 10,000. Uh, I I call it 10,000 men and women of valor. You know, so that's 10,000 people in Dordo right now. Our team is 350 door-to-door -door sales reps nice. you know and i have a crazy vision of one day getting to ten thousand, and it's probably gonna take it's gonna take a decade if or, or less right and i've learned like as we get bigger the systems have to get more dialed in so kind of long-winded question no, here you're but good. yeah what what are some <laughs> systems and processes that have helped you get to where you're at today yeah well dude i know you talk about ten thousand. what if you hit a million you oh, know yeah of course like like what if you hit a million <laughs> yeah you know and and so one of the things that shifted my belief recently is a lot of times we will build what we see 
right? So I'm not familiar with the solar space in any way, shape or form, just to be upfront with you. But I, on the financial space, a lot of times we'll see like, all right, well, this person has X amount and they did it in X time, right? right. So they, they, had, they did X amount and they did it in X time. And then the thought that always goes to my mind, well, we're better now, we have them. Why can't we do that in a 10 year goal in one year? Right. Mm -hmm. And so the way that I started thinking about that is through like what you just talked about is systems. It's the only way systems and leadership. Right. So I kind of break down, I break down all businesses into three, three categories. Right. So we have volume. Okay. Right. Which is in a team building type of environment. How many people can we get into the door to see the business? Mm -hmm. Right. Then we have the actual system which is how do I take somebody from A to B? A being they just started with us, B being they're fully trained and they can start selling, Yeah. right? And then category number three is leadership development. How do we take them from, I'm now a trained person that can go get a result on my own to somebody that can now teach other people to go get a result all on their own, right? Yeah. So I categorized it into those three things. So I have systems when it comes to bringing in the volume, how many okay. sales reps can we get in the door, right? right. Working with us. Then there's the systems that trains people. So now it's how systemized can I make things? Can I make things all streamlined? Can I remove thinking? Right. Right. Um, I think one of the biggest things that slows people down is where people have to stop and think. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't like thinking. It's what we were talking about earlier. Like we wear the same things now all the time. Right. Because yeah. we just try to avoid thinking in all areas yeah. of our life. Right. Yeah. It's wasted energy. Yeah. And so can we remove thinking and can we make things so streamlined and so step by step that a caveman can do it, right? Yeah. And so getting it from point A to point B and being fully trained. And then there's the leadership development aspect, right? And that is how you scale. You don't scale with even the volume. You don't scale with even the systems, even though that's so important, right? Yeah. Those things, you can't scale without those things. Don't get me wrong. But the real scaling of a business and or a team or of an agency, whatever it is, is gonna come from the leadership. Yeah. Because I can't lead 100 on my own, but I can lead 10 who lead 10. Mm-hmm. Right? I can't lead a thousand on my own, but I can lead 10 who lead 10 who lead, lead 10, 10. Right? right? And so that's always been the thought process is how many people can I equip for leadership and how many people can I train to become as good if not better than me? Yeah. So that's how we've scaled to that level. So yes, having things systemized, yes, having everything scripted, yes, um, you know, making things as streamlined as humanly possible, yes, yeah. having a system for the volume to get good quality people in the door, but the biggest thing is having the leadership intact because the leadership is what's going to attract everything else. Yeah. If you don't, if you have poor leadership, it doesn't matter how good of quality people you bring into the door, you won't keep them. Mm. You won't keep them. Yeah. You know, because like let's say you lack integrity and then you you recruit somebody into your business that is a fully fully integrity driven person. Yeah. You're not going to keep them because right. the morals don't align. Yeah. And so a big part of it as well is having someone in those leadership roles that you can't get mad at them for what they're passionate about because they're such a good person. So even the bad person is like, I can't get mad at this person. And the good person's like, I can't get mad at this person. Yeah. Right. And then having them skillful enough that everyone wants to get the results that they're getting. Yeah. You know, so I think it's more of the leadership aspect of things to scale to that size. It reminds me of the, it sounds like you've read the five levels of leadership mm -hmm. and uh, it sounds like a pinnacle, like a pinnacle leader, right? A pinnacle leader makes a lot of level four leaders. Mm -hmm. And those are some really hard people to find and develop, right? It takes time. But I love it because um, I love how you said the third one is the most important. And it reminds me there's a verse in the Bible that says, without the vision, the people perish. Yeah. And I think it's important um, that people always have a vision of what's next. And that's why leadership development is so important mm -hmm. because you want to give whether if someone's at level three, they need to know what's the vision of how to get to level four. If someone's at level eight, how to get to level nine, or, or level one, how to get to level 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, you only do that, like you said, by 10, leading 10, leading 10. And I've, I've discovered one person can't effectively lead slash manage more than like six to 12 is 100%. like the kind of honey hole right there. I agree. You know, 12 is even a little pushing it a little bit, but, but I think 12 is manageable. And so I think it's important, you know, going to the systems that no matter what industry people are in that asking themselves like, okay, like who are my 12? Because I recognize that my time is, bent, is best spent with these 12 and then, or six to 12. And then those six to 12 who are there, six to 12, yeah. right? And then if you do that, then everybody at every level has like the next level, right? And if everyone is, you said earlier, there's a vested interest, right? Mentors should have a vested interest 
eight, because if if I have a vested interest to be like, hey, I can't win unless these six or 12 win, mm -hmm. then cool, I'm gonna pour into them a lot. And then same, if those six or 12 understand that they're six or 12, they can't win unless they're six, six or 12 win, right now it's like a beautiful kind of yeah. collaboration and system to where, and, and I think that's why it's important to also make sure that, you know, it, the, I guess you can say the pay in a way is aligned to where um, nobody can win unless the person below them wins. Exactly. Where corporate America, it's can be opposite. It's like, oh 100%. no, I don't want you to win, right? Because if you win, then that might, that might mean I lose my job, mm -hmm. right? Or that might mean that, oh, it's gonna be harder for me to get my promotion. For sure. And so it, it's cool that you, you know, like it's, it's aligned in such a way where uh, we can both win and stuff yeah. like that. So, what do you look at? I mean, Jesus went 12 wide. Yeah. Right? Went 12 wide and 12 disciples. And now look at the hierarchy yeah. and the agency and the business that <laughs> billions upon billions. You know what billions. I'm saying? And so, yeah. I agree with you. And I think there was a reason if, you know, the greatest man who ever walked the earth had 12, there's probably a reason behind that number, mm -hmm. too, on what our capacity gives us the ability to lead and right. handle at a time. And right. what's cool is even digging deeper into that within his 12, he had a core of three. Mm -hmm. All right. Peter, John, James was like his inner circle. You know, they were the only three that got to go up to the mountain where they saw him transfigured. You know, so like even looking deeper into that, yeah. it's like, although he had 12. Yeah, three. Right. And the three. But he still has three. Nine. Exactly. And so and then, I mean, within those was Peter. Right. And Peter was. You know, Peter, John, James, right? John wrote Book of Revelations and, you know, and so, you know, those three outside of Saul or Paul, sorry, outside of Paul had like the greatest impact really in the ministry. And so it's cool because, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, there's levels and it's, and there's a sign there because could Jesus have done it by himself? Yeah, he's God. He can do anything by himself, you know, but yet he still chose to model like, hey, no, this is how you build something. Yep. This is how you build something that is sustainable because I think I think that should the leader's goal should always be how can I build something sustainable? Mm -hmm. You know, you and I were part of an organization years ago that unfortunately wasn't sustainable. Yeah, you know, we we won't get into the name. We were talking about it out there, <laughs> but it wasn't sustainable, right? Eventually, it fell apart. Why? YPR. Because the YPR, yeah. because <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't built on a solid foundation of like you said like integrity and development. It was a lot of hype and a lot of just you know, we, we money, were chasing, money, money, material, we were chasing material, the wrong material. thing. Yeah, right? yeah, we were chasing the wrong thing. 100%. Where if you focus on leash development on becoming a better version of yourselves, you know, um, like we we have seven values in in my, in my organization, and those seven values are very important, and it gives us a guiding compass of hey, this is who we want to become. This is how we also. This is also who we want to track into our business, and it also makes decision making a lot easier. Because then, you like you said earlier, you're not thinking, exactly. right? You're like, okay, wait, should we promote this person? Hold on, is he is he in alignment with our values? Exactly. Yep, cool, let's promote. Him. Oh, he's not actually. Nope, he doesn't meet these three values. It makes the decision for us, mm -hmm. and it makes the conversation easier. Mm -hmm. If we have to demote somebody or let somebody go, it's like not this personal thing it's like no dude listen these are these are our values we talk about these you're not in alignment with three of them we try to work with you you didn't want to shift so we got to part ways yeah and i've realized like having things like that have, have, have also been very helpful too yeah to talk us through um so you you mentioned insurance so talk us through insurance i i want to i want to learn about insurance so i have an iul right and Index Universal Life Insurance, did I get it right? Yeah. Okay, cool, right? Obviously, there's a lot of benefits there. There's a financial component. Mm -hmm. uh, dude, just talk us through that. Like, I guess if I was just somebody that was like, hey, I wanna <laughs> buy what you're selling, like, what, what, what's the pitch, I guess? What's yeah, the, get it, because if benefit? you die, I'm just gonna no. die. No, absolutely not. But talk us through that. I'm curious, like, you know, what, what are, yeah, what's the benefit, what are the tax benefits, what's just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Well, I think one thing that I always like to mention to people is that I think a lot of times you see in the insurance industry where people be like, this is the end all be all, you can't have anything else, right? Like, and I think everything has, is an opportunity for you to supplement, mm -hmm. right? Obviously there are things that do better than others and you know, an IUL is actually one of those things. If it's done right though, right? Cause there's different agents. There's agents in the industry that line their pockets mm. and then there's agents in the industry that do things right for their clients, right? And there's a huge difference between the two. And one of the things that I always like to teach, you know, the agents that I've worked with over the years is if you do the right thing, it will always come back. Right. Right. Like think about it. I might, if I help you as a client today, I, let's say I double my commission, but then you get your 12 month statement and it doesn't have as, you know, good cash value, which we'll talk about in a second, um, in 12 months. 
well, is that going to make you want to refer me people? Mm. No. Versus I set you up for something today and in 12 months we do your annual review and you're like, man, this is incredible. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to go spread the word of what I just did for you. So um, I think if you just take care of people, right, it always comes back. But basically what an IUL is, it's an opportunity for you to put your money into an insurance based product, right? Look at insurance kind of like a wrapper. And the bigger the wrapper is, the more money you can put in and grow tax free. And the smaller the wrapper, the less money you can stuff into it and grow tax free. Um, IULs are typically tied to the market. So the money's not actually in the market, it's just mirroring it, which means because your money's not actually invested in the market, there's no chance of loss. So there's opportunities for you to do eight, 10, 12, even 20 plus percent rates of return, but be guaranteed not to lose on the downside because of the fact that your money's not actually invested in the market. So you're not participating in those losses. So what's basically happening is you're basically loaning the insurance company money they're transferring the risk onto themselves so that way you and your family do not have to participate in that risk. They take everyone's money as a whole, they go make stupid rates of return on it, and then they give you 12% because your accounts died to the S&P and the S&P did 12% that year. Mm. You with me on that? Yeah. And then because it's within the tax code of life insurance, it's 100% tax free, right? So it grows tax deferred, but when you go to actually touch it, it's tax free, so you don't have to pay taxes on that money. And then what's also cool is you've probably been hearing a lot of like family banks things like that is what people have been talking about where you could become your own family bank. Um, There's a book called What Would the Rockefellers Do? Mm. And basically the Rockefellers leverage life insurance and it's one of the ways that they've been able to remain billionaires for seven generations because they've passed on all their wealth 100% tax-free generation to generation, leveraging life insurance. So the book's called What Would the Rockefellers Do? And so every single time they need money, what they do is they take a loan from it. So instead of going to the bank and taking a loan, they become their own bank, Mm. right? And they go to their policy, they take a loan to themselves, where now you're earning interest on the same dollar in two places. So let me give you an example. Let's say I have $100,000 of cash value in my account. They look at that cash value as collateral. So they will loan me up to what I have in cash value because they know if something happens to me, they'll just keep that money. So let's say I have $100,000 of cash value and I take a loan for 50,000. So now I'll take a loan for that 50,000. I can take that 50,000, put it on a down payment on a home. I can invest it into another business. I could buy a car or whatever it is. And then I can pay myself back. If I pay myself back, it's as if I never took the money out. So that 50,000 that I loaned myself never actually came out of the policy. That 50,000 is still earning interest in the account. And so as long as I pay myself back, it's as if I never took the money out at all. I see. Now I earn interest on the same dollar in two different places at once. Hmm. Right? Because I could take that 50, flip a property, pay myself back. Right? Now I just made X amount of return here, while also the money never came out of the account because it was a loan, not a withdrawal. I see. See where I'm going with that? What happens if you don't pay it back? If you don't pay it back, basically what happens at that point is it's as if you took it out. Gotcha. Yeah. So then you just, what, lose the return that you would you lose the return that you would have made on the 50,000 which is probably still better than like taking a a, a, I don't know an interest or like a loan from a bank right I don't know what they would charge you nowadays Mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's not oh yeah exactly I mean right now I know borrowing is very expensive yeah for sure like I'll give you an example um what a client that I helped years ago called me this morning and she had a couple hundred thousand dollars of cash value within her account and um and she called me and she just said thank you wow I said for what She said, I was buying an apartment building and I needed an extra $50,000. I tried to get a hard money loan, but that was at 13%. And so I took a $50,000 loan to myself and it's at a 2.5% interest rate. But the money has also been averaging 8%. So that's still a net 5.5%. So that 50,000 is still netting 5.5% rate of return. Yeah. You with me on that? Yeah, yeah. Right? And she said, I couldn't be more grateful. Yeah. All right. I, I went through all these different things and I realized last minute that I had this insurance policy with all wow. this money in it and I didn't withdraw. I just took a loan to myself, bought the apartment building. She's going to flip that apartment building. She'll pay herself back. Now I'm going to say what my, mine is. I've had an IUL for two, two and a half years. I, <laughs> I'm like going to be either really happy or really upset. I don't want the cash value. <laughs> well, like I said, it comes down to structuring. You know, like yeah. that, I can't stress it enough because they're not all created equal, sure. like not even a little bit. Um, and so you got to have the right professional and then you also have to have the right type of product because not sure. every single IUL allows you to take loans while earning interest at the same time either, you know? So it kind of varies, but do you have the right professional? Like I haven't sat down with a client in years. Yeah. Um, you know, there's agents that do that now, but, but it's just making sure that the right people are there to help you with right. it. 
because you could it's a great way for you to line your pockets if you don't operate yeah. with integrity should people want to learn more about that or you know they want to maybe get an IUL I, I know you say you don't you know you you now focus on the, the team aspect and the, the building and the training all that um, so but what's the best way though that they can reach out to you I don't know if there's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you go to Matthew Welsh on Instagram, W E L S H, um, just Matthew Welsh, and you can DM me and I can get you set up with somebody cool. that'll take care of you. There you go. Matthew Welsh, Instagram. Yeah. Come on. He also drops very fire content. So I appreciate yeah, it. Stay yeah. tuned for that. <laughs> but that's awesome, man. I mean, uh, so are there other things outside of IULs for insurance or is that? Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of different things. There's like term life insurance, um, but not the old kind, right? So in 2016, they came out with something called living benefits. And anybody that got a term policy before 2016 has an old type of insurance. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when people hear life insurance, they think of death, right? If you die, your family gets a large check. The reason I like living benefits or the new kind is because it has something called living benefits. Meaning if you have any type of critical, chronic, or terminal disease, uh, depending on the severity of that illness, you can access up to 90% of the death benefit while you're alive to support your family. Nice. Right. So like, let's say I have a million dollar policy and let's say I'm paying $40 a month for it. All right. Or I have a million dollar policy. I pay $43 a month for it. If I were to get diagnosed with an illness, depending on that severity, I'm getting 25 to 90% of that money. And it's going to support me and help me. Right. Yeah. Cause most people have medical insurance, but what takes care of your living expenses? That's where the living benefits comes in. I see. Right. And the reason I value it so much is just cause I had a dad that battled cancer for 14 years wow. and he had life insurance, but it didn't have living benefits. Um, and so when he passed, my mom got taken care of, which is mm. pretty cool, you know, and um, especially being in the industry for about six years at the time and then having a dad that believed in it enough to take care of his own family. It was a really cool thing to see. Wow. Um, but once again, he had an old policy, so he didn't have all the living benefits to support us through all those hard times as he was battling cancer because yeah. there was a lot of difficult times when losing his income and he was self-employed. And then my mom was self-employed and her having to take off work to go drive him to and from doctor's mm. appointments. So the income just started disappearing and bills started stacking up, debt started back stacking up, and we just ended up in a very hard time, yeah. you know? And so if you have somebody, um, or if he would have had something like that, which he couldn't even have had it back then, but if he would have had something like that in today's time, um, it would have made things a lot easier for yeah. our family, you know? Would you say that that's uh, a big reason for your why? Yeah, for sure. your dad, which, sorry for your loss, by the way. I appreciate it. But um, that, no that's, that's what drives you, is yeah. ensuring that people don't find themselves maybe in the same situation that your parents found themselves in. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I've just got literally the chills through my body. Um, I also look at it as a way to honor my dad, mm. you know, like my dad was always the greatest, greatest man I ever met. Never heard him use a curse word, never heard him raise his voice. Mm. Um, never heard him talk ill of another human being. Um, one of the most integrity driven people I've ever met his meet his, um, his contracting business, which was just him and us boys whenever he needed us. Uh, growing up was Brian Integrity Services, just because he just believes in doing the right thing. Um, great man of faith. Like I remember there was a moment where the church was literally supporting us. Wow. Right? Church was taking care of us, feeding our family. We were on food stamps. We were in a very bad spot. And um, I remember sitting in the pew with my dad and the offering came around. And my dad opened his wallet and that $25 that was there came from the church. And he pulled out the only $25 in his wallet and he put it in the offering, right? And, and excuse me, and I realized at the lowest moment, he still served. Wow. At his lowest moment, and that was with literally a IV bag hooked up to him in the church, bald, you know, with a beanie on, right? Like pulled it out and put it in the tray, mm. you know? And so I, I realized that in that moment, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you're at your lowest moment, there's always an opportunity to serve. Right. You know? And yeah. so that was just the man he was. So he inspired me and I try to tell his story and honor him as much as I possibly can. And he inspired me to be the dad that I am and, um, and it means something to me, you know? Yeah. Powerful story. Um, really is. Cause if you can learn to give at your lowest point, I, I don't think you'll ever lack happiness and joy. Yeah. You know, cause then when you do have, I mean, if you can find ways to be happy and still pour yourself mm -hmm. when you got nothing, then when you do have, everything you know you won't uh, t too often we align our sense of worth and value to the things that we have yeah but really it's in, in what we're giving and it's 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 sacrificial it's like who you know it's like in the bible it talks about there's a parable where 
uh, you know, there's somebody that gives, I don't know, a hundred bucks, but they're a millionaire or, but then there's a, a woman who gives a penny, but that's all she has is yeah. a penny. And Jesus is like, who gave more, mm-hmm. you know, like who gave more, the woman that gave a penny or the guy that gave, let's just say $10,000, exactly. but, but he's a millionaire, you know, it's like, well, the woman that gave a penny, because that's all she had. And so powerful story. It's a, it's a good reminder that joy and happiness is, is found in giving is found in giving of ourselves. And, and yeah, so, uh, what was, what was his name? Brian, Brian, shout out to Brian <laughs> for being uh, just a great voice of influence. So it's awesome, right. man. Dude, talk us through your family. Um, I know you, you mentioned you love being a dad. You got two girls. I got one daughter, oh, one daughter. who's two and then one that's going to be here in November. Come on. That's what it is. Okay, yeah. cool. Dude, that's awesome. So, Talk us through that, man. What's that? What's that like for you? Oh man, there's there's nothing greater. Um, you know, I, you and me were talking about offline. Yeah. Like one of the things that we're big on is making sure that we dominate in all areas of her life. Right. Right. Like I think people, you know, one, my wife grew up in La Jolla, okay. right? And one of the things is, which is so a she, wealthy. So she went to the wealthy schools while you were in Claremont. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Right. Um, that's how I actually met her because okay, okay. my friends that I had there down there. Go. But one of the things that she always saw was parents were too successful and they never saw their kids. Mm. And so she saw all these kids on drugs and, you know, like all the time. And um, and it was because their parents were never present and they were trying to get their attention, you know, and that's probably the psychological reason. I don't know if it's the exact reason, but that's what it seemed like, sure. right? And, um, and, and then she grew up with a mom who battled with alcoholism, was in and out of jail because of it. Uh, her dad also battled cancer. Um, and was in the hospital a lot. And so for her, having a family was everything because she never really felt like she had one, mm. right? Um, the Christmas is everything. So number one is I want to do everything to give her the family that she always wanted to have. Yeah. And uh, she always tells me that she's healing her child, her inner child, by being the mom that she is today. Wow. And she's an incredible mom. Um, and so you know, we're just really big on making sure that we build an incredible life, not just an incredible financial situation. And um, I think the more intentional you are with your time, you can have it all, where you can have an incredible, successful, thriving business and financial situation, but then have an incredible relationship with your kids, where you're the actual example, Mm. right? Like one thing I always talk about, like the last thing I would ever want is, you know, if I have a son one day for him to grow up putting on another man's last name because they went out and chased a dream and I didn't. Wow. Right. Like you see all these people, they put on Le- LeBron jerseys and Messi jerseys. And I, here's the deal. I, I appreciate and I respect talent. But the fact that you have to wear another man's last name in order to have pride. Like that's an issue. Right. I, I, I tell people that our sons, our daughters, that we should be their superhero. Exactly. That when, they, when they're asked the question, who's your hero? Sorry, not superhero, hero. When, when they ask who, who's their hero, that they say, oh, my dad is my hero. For sure. And that when they say like, hey, who's the most like passionate or dialed in or, or even athletic person you know, they're like, oh, my, my dad is. Oh, yeah. You know, because there, there's power in that. So something I started doing um, a few months ago with my son is every Saturday we go on a run. You know, he's five. We do a mile and a half run and we do push ups along the way. We do some pull ups, you know. I, 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 I try to push him a little bit, you know, to like to where he's like, Oh, this hurts, like I wanna yeah. stop. I'm like, no, come on, just a little bit longer. Because I wanna instill those things in him. Yeah. Right. And I want him to see me like, am I the most athletic person in the world? No. But in his world I am exactly. right now. And I want him to always view me in that in that, in that limelight. Like, dude, my dad's like Superman, you know? Yeah, he's an ox, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. You know, and another thing too is like I'm very intentional. You know, I think one of the things that business equipped me for is how to be a parent, mm-hmm. right? Because to be successful in, in leadership, it's the same thing, right? What do you do in leadership? You empower people, you equip them, you right. want to help them become confident. And I think the number one thing that you can give your children is confidence, yeah. right? And so for me, when it comes to my daughter, I'm always trying to figure out ways, how do I build confidence into her, yeah. right? Um, so how do I build confidence into her? And then how do I be the man that she... Because obviously she's gonna grow up and she's gonna look at me and then she's gonna go marry someone just like me. Exactly. Right. And so for me, it's like I wanna be such a high standard that she she has that high standard, right? right? Like, you know, whether it's for her, I'll open her door. Whether it's for her mom, my wife, I'll open that door. Um, every single morning when she wakes up, my wife will dress her and the first person she wants to show is me. So she comes up, she goes, Daddy, and I go, You look so beautiful. Yeah. You know, like and I just wanna give her the greatest reaction in the world. So if another man doesn't 
react to her beauty that way every single time they see her that she's like this isn't the man for me right yeah. so that's another thing like equipping that confidence into her but then also setting a standard of what a man should be because i know she's going to grow up one day and go look for a man just like me yeah and either when i'm walking her down that aisle i'm either going to regret the man that i was yeah or i'm going to be like i did a good job dude this reminds me of a story a buddy of mine shared with me about his daughter so he has a daughter i think she's like six or seven but I guess he was telling a story about how uh, her daughter was at a playground or something, and like the kids were just being mean, and they were calling her ugly, you know, and you know to a six seven year old like yeah. that would crush them right like Absolutely. no one wants to be called ugly, and you know she comes and tells her tells the mom like oh yeah these kids are calling me ugly, and then you know she like uh, the mom asks her like well what, what 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 how are you feeling about that and then she like stops and she's like well they're lying mom. And then they're like, what do you mean? They're like, well, they're lying because daddy calls me beautiful all the time. So I know I'm beautiful. And it's like, the it was something like that. But it was like the power of words, right? Yeah. And the power of a father, the, the, the voice of a father that although all these voices were calling her ugly, she chose to be like, no, no, no. The voice of my father is more powerful than the voice of these kids. And she was like, no, you guys are lying. Like, you guys are tripping pretty much, you know? Like, yep. she's like, what do you mean? My dad calls me beautiful, so I know I'm beautiful. Yeah, and you're I just the think, one. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, <laughs> exactly, yeah, you are. And I just thought that was a beautiful story about yeah. the importance of how it's important for us to speak life, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about, you know, life and death is the power of our tongue. And yeah, that, like, kids urge for us to call them beautiful, handsome, strong, confident, bold, like, you can do this, you know? And so uh, it's great, you know. We, we, me and my wife, we started following this girl, this or mom. She posts really good parenting content, and like she'll she'll kind of like outline like, hey, you can either approach a situation like this or like that. I think I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't know the name, but my yeah, wife yeah, she'll like yeah, either like with fear or trust, you know, like instead of like you know, don't do this, like you know, say, hey, can I trust you with this, you know, and like those small little shifts. And being a parent, I've discovered make a big difference. But yeah. you also compared it to business. Same thing in business, right? Like, yeah, I feel like business prepared me for being a parent because oh, sure. you're still empowering people, and you know you're about to have a second one. You're gonna see like, uh, their each personality is different. You know what works for one kid may not Doesn't work for work. the other. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like we have a 14 month old now, and like his personality is coming out more and more, and we're noticing that they both are very different. You know, our five-year-old is very like active and wants to run all the time and like can't sit still. Like, dude, we can take him to the playground for six hours straight. He will still want to go. Be sure. yeah, yeah, like that's how he is. Where the 14-month-old we're noticing, he's kind of more chill and lax and kind of just goes with the flow. And you know, he, you know, but when, but when our oldest was his age, he was already like just running around everywhere, jumping, you know. And he's still that way today. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so going back to business, it. When you lead multiple people, you have to learn to lead different personality types. For sure. And some are really go-getters, some are a little slower, some are methodical, some are visionary, some are analytical, and same some hate children. to be led. Yeah, some hate to be led. Yeah. Some hate to be led. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was mentoring um, this woman the other day, or before I mentor somebody, I just get to know them, right? And and so I asked her. I said, "So tell me about your family." She was like, "Oh, I got my son, and then I got my daughter." And I was like, "So tell me what what do you love most about them, right? Like, tell me about them." And um, and she was talking about how she she has to parent each one of them differently. And I told her, I said, "You're ready for leadership." And she said, "Well, what are you talking about?" She's like, "I've never, I don't know anything about the this or that or the third. Like, I've never worked with this. I don't know the products. I don't know any of this, right?" And I said, "Yeah, but." leadership is about identifying who you're working with and understand how they need to be led. Yeah. And you've already learned to do that with your own children. Yeah. Or most people don't. Most people parent their children the exact same way because of the lack of awareness. Wow. Right. I said, you have an awareness that your daughter needs to be, you know, you know, punished in a sense differently than the son. And they also need to be encouraged differently than the son. And yeah. you, you've realized that already. So that awareness means that that awareness is in you of human nature and how different people operate. Right. That right there, you transition that into leadership. It's the exact same way. Yeah. Right. Because I have people that hate to be led. So then guess what? I have to lead them completely different because they don't like to be told what to do. Yep. Right. And I don't think any leader likes to be told what to do. I like, I think they like to feel encouraged that they were a part of the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 
And then you have people that want to be told exactly what to do, right? Where they only take action steps if you give them step one, two, three, and four, and then you have to follow up. Did you get four? Yeah, I got it done, right? So understanding that every person's a little bit different. Every person needs to go at their own pace, but then learning how to move each one of them individually right. is everything in leadership. So I told her, I was like, you got it down. Yeah. Now you just got to apply it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leadership is messy. I always say that because yeah. you're dealing with people. You're dealing with different personality types. And what works with some may not work with others. Mm -hmm. You're right. The guy that the people that are very go getters, motivators. If you try to tell them what to do, they take it as micromanaging. Yeah, and, and they're going like, the opposite direction. Yeah, but then yeah. The, the the people that maybe aren't as much. Yeah, they need to be told. Like I, I tell my guys all the time. Like, hey, you have to remember because sometimes we operate through our own paradigm, mm -hmm. and we're like, well, I'm a go getter. I'm a self starter. I take initiative, so everybody else should too. And we're like, no, but we have to remember that most of the guys that we bring into our team have like, you know, what I call like a W2 mindset, right? Yeah. Like they, you know, like most of us went to public school for 12 years, so we were told <laughs> when to be there, what to think, you know, you have to raise your hand to be spoken to, all that stuff. So we're conditioned in such a way to where we're told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And when we get new guys in, you know, some some of my guys were like, oh yeah, this guy just doesn't work, you know, he's lazy. I'm like, well, have That's you given- That's a cop out of your leadership. Yeah, I'm like, well, have you given them structure? You know, you have to recognize the majority of people that we bring on, like that are in their early stages, they need structure. You gotta tell mm -hmm. them what to do. Like, yeah, we're 1099s. And sure, like, you know, we, we like, th there still is an element of like, they gotta do it on their, on their own. However, like give them the structure, tell them like, hey, this is where to knock. Hey, tell them these are the hours I wanna see you out there. Hey, this is how many doors you should be hitting or how many people I, I wanna see you talk to. Hey, at nine o'clock, here's a video for you to watch. Like, Give them the structure, tell them what to do Agreed. because they actually need that. And I think too often, I mean, some of my guys forget that because in, in our own minds, we're like, well, I do it, so you should too. And it's like, no, yeah. you have to remember, they don't think like you yet, but they will, Yeah. right? And parenting, same thing, right? Our kids right now can't think for themselves yet, but one day they will. They'll be able to make their own decisions. And our goal is that when they get there, that they make great decisions and, and all that. So it's awesome to see just the similarities between between the two. So, yeah. well, Matthew, uh, dude, this has been great, man. Um, you know, as we close up, just uh, don't know if you have any closing remarks, any any closing thoughts you want to share. I know we talked about business, leadership, insurance, family, you know, um, you know, your, your dad was an inspiration on here. So uh, kind of a wide range of many awesome things. But uh, I just want to give you the opportunity if you have any kind of closing thoughts, uh, words of encouragement, words of, words of wisdom for us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, thank you for having me, my man. This has been incredible. And um, one thing that I'll tell you is like, there's people that you speak to on the phone, there's people that you speak, you know, you see on Instagram, and then you know, they always say the worst thing you can do is meet your hero, unfortunately, yeah. you know? And so if you're, if you are listening to this and you've been following the general over here, um, I just want you guys to know that he's even better in person than on camera. I promise you that he's a, he's a good dude. He's swoller too. Just uh, so you know, yeah. like he's swoller too. I didn't pay him a hundred dollars. So I just <laughs> under the just table. Under the table. No, yeah. Just kidding. No. Yeah. But, um, but I'll just tell you like whatever it is that you're going through or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, whether it's a dream, a goal, an ambition, whatever it is, just stay the course, just stay the course. Cause every single time you get distracted, every single time you listen to someone who's not where you wanna be, every single time you pull over because you have something going on in your life, you're just pushing back the estimated time of arrival. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that a little bit earlier with the GPS, yeah. right? So every single time you stop to take a break, every single time you stop because you get a pop tire and adversity pops up, every single time you pull over, you're pushing back your estimated time of arrival. And I would just encourage you to stay focused, stay focused on what it is that you're trying to do, whether it's better your marriage, whether it's better your family life, whether it's become stronger in your faith or your fitness or business financially, just stay focused and just realize that that focus and, and succeeding at something is not the process of prioritizing one thing over something else. It's the process of, of eliminating distractions, right? So if you want to become a better dad, it's not prioritizing that over everything else. It's the process of eliminating everything that's keeping you from being a good dad, mm. right? If you want to succeed financially, it's not the process of choosing that over everything else in your life. It's the process of eliminating everything that's keeping you from making those good financial decisions or business decisions. So I would just encourage you to eliminate all distractions that you have going on in your life and just get laser focus on what you want, right? For me, it's business and family. Those are my two focuses. And I always tell people, people are like, well, what about health? What about your faith? Those are foundational. 
I can't succeed in business and I can't succeed in my family without my faith and my fitness. Mm. So those are not even focuses. Those are f standards and those are foundations. So that way I can have two focuses, which is growing my businesses and making an impact there and growing my family and making an impact there. Wow. And so I would just encourage you to eliminate the distractions, get dialed in, not seven streams of income, focus on one, and then you can take everything else and overflow it into the things that you want to do. Come on. That's awesome. That's that's a phenomenal horse of wisdom. And guys, as always, if you want to get in contact with Matthew Welsh, if you want to learn more about insurance and what, what he's doing and how he's helping many people uh, really win at life, uh, hit him up as well. Uh, we didn't even talk about real estate, but, uh, you know, Matthew's also a subject matter expert when it comes to real estate. He currently manages $12 million in uh, real estate here uh, in California, in San Diego. Let's get it.